Okay, so looking at experimental data, um, they're all going to pretty much kind of look the same. So here we have several different trials that are happening. Okay, and typically you have um, concentration of your reactants. So in this case, there are two different reactants. So if there was only one reactant, you would have only one column here, right? If there was like three, three reactants, you'd have three different columns. And then you have a column that tells you the rate of production or the rate of the reaction. And remember, the whole purpose of using this data is to figure out what the exponents are going to be for the reactants. So in order to figure that out, we have to see what is happening to the rate when we change their concentration. So like right now, for example, I can see I have two reactants. So I'd have R is equal to K. I'd have iodate in this case. And then we'd have bisulfite. Okay. And we have some question marks, right? I don't know the exponent of this. I don't know the exponent of that yet. And that's really going to be the goal of what we're going to do here. So... And don't worry about K for now. K is the last thing that we are going to solve for. So we need to figure out those exponents before we can take a look at K. So when you're doing these, they all kind of work the same way. We want to see when we change the concentration of one reactant, what impact that has on the rate. So it's important that you want to pick two trials where the concentration is changing for the one we want to solve for. So let's say we do iodate. So we want iodate to change, but we want to pick two trials where the other reactants are not changing. So it's important that you only have one reactant changing at a time, because if you have two things changing, you're not going to know which one is the one that's actually affecting the rate. Right? If you have too many variables that are changing at one time, you'll have no um, evidence to prove what is happening and what's causing change to what. So it doesn't matter if there's two reactants, if there's five reactants, the one you're trying to solve the exponent for, you want that one to be changing and every other reactant to be constant. So for this particular example, I'm going to choose trial 1 and 2 because 1 and 2 is not changing for the other reactant. Okay, so when I go from 2.0 times 10 to the negative 3 to 4.0, essentially what's happening there is there is a doubling of the concentration, right? So we want to know, okay, when the concentration doubles, what happened to the rate? So the rate also doubled, right? So we have went from 0.8 times 10 to the negative 3 to 1.6. So it's times 2. So what we've just proven there is because the concentration doubled and we got the same output as the rate, that proves we have an exponent 1 for our iodate, right? Very good. So... We know our iodate. So now we're going to solve for bisulfite. So for bisulfite, we want to do the same thing. We want the bisulfite to be changing, but we now want iodate to stay the same. I'm just going to put this up here. Just use a different color. So for this case, we're going to use trials 2 and 3 because iodate is staying the same. Okay. So we notice that going from 3 to 2, the concentration for bisulfite is doubling. If we look at the rate, it's going from 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. So it's actually quadrupling in this case. 0 0.2 times 4 is 0 0.8. So for our bisulfite, we doubled the concentration but we had a quadruple outcome, which means our exponent is a 2. Okay, and that's essentially how you're going to do that. The main thing and the biggest error that I see time and time again is the trials that are being picked are the wrong trials. You want the goal, like the one that you are trying to solve for has to be changing Every other reactant must be constant. 
because if I have this changing and this changing, I'm not going to be sure which one is actually having the proper outcome. So what do we know right now? So right now we know R is equal to K. We know iodate is to the 1. And we know bisulfite is to the 2. Okay? So the last piece to this to have a proper, if something asks you to write the rate law equation or the rate law expression, that means that you have to solve for the exponents and you also have to solve for k. That's the last piece. Because actually we cannot solve for this once until we figure out the exponents. So at this point, it's actually just going to be straightforward algebra. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a trial and we're going to plug in all the information from that trial. So for example, if we were to pick trial one, I have my initial concentration for iodate, which will go here. I have my concentration for my bisulfite, which will go here. And I have the rate of my reaction, which will go under my R. So essentially we have everything here we need so that we can solve for K. Now it actually does not matter which trial you pick. Just make sure you're picking all the numbers from one single row. So if I were to pick trial three, I would have to pick trial three concentration and trial three rate. Either way, no matter what trial you pick, your K should come out to be the same every time um, because it's all coming from the same experiment, right? It's the same reaction is happening under the same conditions. So I happen to pick trial number one. So you can see here, this is the rate from trial number one. These are the concentrations from trial number one. So we're solving for K. So we plug those all in. Now keep in mind, um, I did a little on the side to show you here. Um, the units for K will be different every single time because the unit for K will depend on what your exponents are that are involved in this calculation. Right, so for example, this is moles per liter, but you're multiplying it by moles per liter squared. So, right, this square is really moles squared per liter squared, and you're multiplying. When you multiply your exponents, they're additive. So once we add these two together, or I should say multiply, here's your value, moles to the cube per liter to the cube. So then when we're solving for K, we want to isolate for K, you're going to cross those out, whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. But the units here is going to be moles per liter per second divided by moles cubed per liter cubed. So remember, when you have a fraction over a fraction and you bring the fraction in the denominator up, you have to take the reciprocal of that. So instead of being moles per liter, sorry, moles cubed per liter cubed, when you flip this up, it's moles per liter per second times liters cubed per moles cubed. So what ends up happening is for this particular reaction, the unit is liters squared mole per mole squared per second. And you're solving for your K value. Um, and that's essentially your rate law. So maybe press pause, take a look at this in a little bit more detail. But to be perfectly honest, it's simple algebra. Maybe what's a little bit tricky is the unit portion here. Um, but in terms of this, right, you're taking this value, you're squaring it, you're multiplying it by that, and then you're isolating for K, right? You have this, you have this, you have this, and you're isolating for K. So the units will change, though, because what if this was squared and then this one was to the 3? Or if one was to the 0 and one was to a 1, right? The units will be different for K depending on how many reactants and what the exponents are for those reactants. Okay, so the last piece of this um, chapter that we're going to go through is um, looking at half-life. Um, so you may have already looked at this in advanced functions where you're looking at the half-life of a radioisotope. So just to recap, um, when we say radioisotopes or nuclear decay, right, essentially this is where you have an isotope that over time will break down into smaller isotopes. So here's an example of a uranium isotope, and actually this is doing 
alpha decay. You remember that from grade 11. So what's happening here is an alpha particle is coming off of this nucleus and it's now become an isotope of thorium. So all nuclear decays, they almost look like they are decomposition reactions, okay? But the reason why we call them, of course, a nuclear reaction is because the nucleus of the element is changing, okay? So all rate equations look similar for um, radioisotopes. They are, and the reason for that is here. I'm going to highlight this. Okay, so nuclear decays are always going to be first order processes. So if you remember that order, this term, is talking about the exponents of the reaction. So if we were going to write a Ray law expression for this reaction here, R is equal to K, the reactant, and then the exponent is 1. So it doesn't matter what your isotope is. Right, so here I have another reaction. My rate law is going to be R is equal to K, A to the 1, because this is a nuclear reaction. Okay, So it's always a first order reaction. Now, just to review a term, so you may or may not know this term yet, a term called half-life. Okay, so what half-life is indicative of is talking about, let's say you had a certain amount of your starting reactant. So let's say we had 100 grams of A. A half-life is basically the amount of time that it would take for this reaction to take place until we're left with half of the amount. So we started off with 100 grams of A, and over time, right, the nuclear decay is a natural process. This is going to release those alpha particles. Same thing over here. And a half-life will tell us, okay, well, let's say this process took um, two hours, right? So in two hours, we went from 100 grams to 50 grams. Two hours would be its half-life. So let's say another two hours go by. We had 50 grams, now we would have 25 grams. Let's say another two hours go by, then this is cut in half again. So every half-life that goes by half of the amount that you had at the start of that time would be gone, okay? So if you were to graph out the half-life um, like time versus the quantity that you have originally, so you start off with 100% of your sample, as soon as you have 50% of your sample, guess what? You've passed a half-life amount of time. Now, half-life can be two hours, two days, 20 minutes, uh, can be 20 years. So the ra every radioisotope has its own unique half-life. Even if you have isotopes of the same element, each isotope has its own rate. It has its own half-life. 